So hi everybody, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, as Margot says, uh, my name is Nicole Harris, uh, and I'm here with my ex-colleague Sagiti Okunaite. We were no normally typically known as Nikita over in the TFC set world, as people couldn't remember which one of us was which. Um, but we're here to talk to you today, um, as Margot says, about some of the toxic behaviours we've seen um, within the security community and how we can move forward from them. Um, so, uh, one of the things that Sagita and I both have in common um, is that we were both humanities students. Uh, we, we studied humanities uh, in various different degrees, um, but then came into the security and IT world through rather unusual routes. We now between us have over 18 years combined experience in the security community and security projects. Um, as Margot said, we've led security training and coordinated security training um, programs worldwide. Um, we've been responsible for managing uh, large scale European projects and services in the security space. And as people most probably know us from, um, we've coordinated diverse security communities between us. So despite of this uh, experience and having been in the security world and in the community for quite a while, we still um, feel that because we come from a non-traditional background and we are both uh, female in and in a, so in a very strong minority in this field, um, we, we have a unique um, perspective on how the security teams and organizations work and um, the things in the security culture that can be labeled as toxic um, that we should avoid. So that's exactly what we want to present on today. And we have identified 10 of these uh, behaviors. Yep, so here are our top 10 toxic security behaviors. Um, and we're talking generically about security teams, but we think these all um, actually relate specifically to CSERT and CERT teams as well. Um, we want to say as well that we have overwhelmingly found lots of welcome in the community um, and seen lots of really great um, practices, um, but that doesn't mean there's nothing that needs to be changed out there. So in no particular order, um, our top 10 toxic behaviors that we've seen are security through obscurity, the myth of meritocracy, hero culture, ableist design, punitive education, security silos, culture of no, lack of diversity, loser attitude, and the blame game. Yeah, and it's obviously um, not that we, we see that in every organization or in every team, but um, we think that all of you are going to identify at least some of them um, um, from your experience in the current culture or our previous where you worked previously. So what we are hoping um, is that all attendees um, will see some of the behaviors and approaches that you can, um, you can uh, relate to, and then you will take at least one thing home that you can change and improve in your organization. So I'm gonna go up first and start with the myth of meritocracy. Um, so the word meritocracy has been used uh, for a really long time in our community. Um, and it's typically seen as a quite a positive force within security and in the IT industry. Most people seem to have forgotten that the person who, who coined the world, word, his name was Michael Young. He wrote an essay called The Rise of the Meritocracy. He really intended it to describe a dystopian future and not something we should try and emulate. I was actually introduced to this word really early on in my IT career. Um, I was asked to work with a group of men who formed a development team for a well-used piece of software in the higher educational community, which I will, of course, not name. Um, and they earnestly spent quite a lot of time explaining to me how they accepted coders onto the team on the basis of merit. And they were really proud to be a meritocracy. What they were really not able to see, though, was that their judgment of merit didn't really relate to the code or the work being delivered, but on the person type that they wanted on their team. And that person type was inevitably a white man of a certain age with certain attitudes and certain beliefs. So the idea that all you need is kind of talent plus effort to succeed in your career has, I think, by now been well disproven, despite efforts of some people that say all we need to do is lean in and we'll be just fine. And we need to talk about privilege. Privilege is not necessarily the presence of money or power or advantage, but rather can simply be the absence of obstacles and the benefits of looking like someone who belongs within a community. Um, and I think our community often strongly feels it is a meritocratic space, um, and that can sometimes be true. The rituals we go through to build trust with each other through organizations like FIRST, like TFC CERT, do seem to bear this out. Um, however, even those who believe their actions and reactions are purely based on merit can often prioritize and select people that most aptly mirror the dominant group at the time. So in this process, we end up something that looks more like a meritocracy than a meritocracy, and then the cycle becomes self-selecting. 
One of the areas where this can become most pronounced is in recruitment, and there's some simple things we can do to improve that. Managers often look for someone who fits in with the existing team and is just like the existing team, and then falls into the trap of selecting the same sort of person over and over and over again. And we can do some simple checks um, to avoid this, such as running your job um, advert through online tools that look for balance and look for the um, bias terms. And um, you can actively consider whether you need a different and diverse type of person in your team rather than another clone. I have used one of those tools recently and I, I feel like uh, it was very useful in attracting um, more different at a, uh, applicants at least, if not employees. Um, the next thing that we identified that is um, part of this toxic team culture is the so-called hero culture. And uh, just in general, there hasn't been enough research done on these um, toxic team cultures, but one of the people who has been researching this is uh, called uh, let's go back, <laughs> Janan Budge uh, from uh, Forrester. And um, in her research, um, she called out 10 leading causes of toxic toxicity. Yeah. And one of them was the hero culture. Um, so um, she says that those individuals with a hero complex um, have a very negative um, in, uh, impact on the team culture. So, um, you know, we're talking about the rock stars, the people who think that they know, they know it all and they're the only ones who can solve uh, a problem. But the real problem is that they're often not uh, very good team players. And um, sadly, it's more prevalent than we think. Um, so this, uh, this hero culture or having a hero person um, in your organization or your team um, uh, leads to two uh, big problems. So one of them is the bottleneck um, when an employee the hero employee has a difficulty completing their task in a timely and effective manner uh, because they simply take on too much work thinking that they're the only ones who can do it and they don't share the, the workload. Uh, but the second thing that is even more damaging is that this hero culture is the opposite of the team culture, which we all uh, probably agree that is something that we want to strive for, working together in a more collaborative way. Um, so having those heroes create um, a huge amount of dysfunction in your team or organization. Um, the problem is that the heroes often have a fixed mentality. Uh, they are less likely to take risks because they fear failure, uh, which means that they cannot learn from their mistakes. And um, what needs to be fostered in, instead of this um, fixed mentality is a growth mentality. And that can be achieved by, first of all, diversifying your work, uh, workplace and um, putting experience and enthusiasm into the mix. And you get this enthusiasm from new people in the, in the field, new recruits who have um, some skills um, and capabilities that they can bring into your organization, um, possibly new ways of thinking um, and uh, new, ways in, uh, new ways of communicating and new ways of collaborating. So one of the one of the advice that we found uh, on how to solve this problem is that if you have younger employees or just say new employees in uh, in your organization, then um, one way of providing those new perspective and ideas to the hero people is to um, uh, to start uh, rever reverse mentoring in your organization, where younger people or new people in your organization are mentoring the older people or the people who joined the the organization first. Um, so our next toxic culture is about security through obscurity, which is a pretty well known phrase. We typically apply it to approaches that keep the inner workings of system secrets. I think it's pretty widely disproven as effective way to keep systems secure. However, it kind of tipped over into human behavior as well. The need to be obscure about projects or information related to security teams can be an easy sort of knee jerk reaction to a perceived notion of keeping information secure. So we can probably all agree that data classification is also, of course, an essential process within an organization. We always have documents that certain people should not access, privileges that certain users should not have. Um, but that's very different from approaches where teams refuse to share information or give users adequate training or directions in the belief that keeping information secret is keeping information secure. This can become even more problematic when teams stop communicating important information up to managers. So having an excellent communications plan and actively ensuring that you're communicating is a key element for any kind of team, but very specifically for security teams. While CSET teams often have really well-developed communication techniques for dealing with an incident, for example, they interact well with trusted CERT teams outside their organization to analyze and resolve issues. They can often be quite poor at internal communication, particularly in terms of management engagement and user engagement. And it's those kind of circumstances where transparency can be in many senses, a bigger key to security than secrecy. 
To give an example here, one of the perhaps biggest security failures of the 20th century was the Space Shuttle's Challenger disaster in 1986. And although a technical fault was the underlying cause of the issue, the investigations into disaster most pointed, mostly pointed to communication issues as the biggest factor in the fallout. Um, and the following issues were, were noted. There was a lack of communication with the press, which led to unhelpful speculation and incorrect information becoming fact and the perceived notion of the public. Problems were not communicated or discussed outside reporting channels. Sign off was permitted without input from all of the appropriate teams and without proper briefings and information being withheld from certain groups of engineers in the name of security. So in these scenario and in many of the scenarios we see in our working days, better attention to communication planning could have quite literally saved lives. Yeah, the next example that we uh, picked is uh, punitive <coughs> education. And um, I think that, that here we're talking about training and we all agree that security training is very important on any budget with no money or huge budgets, but sometimes it can go really wrong. And a typical scenario where we see a lot of examples of that is fishing your own employees, not fishing, <laughs> fishing. <laughs> so in that, in that scenario, um, a phishing an email is sent, some employees will report it to you, um, and some will inevitably inevitably click on the link and do the wrong thing, and then they will need to be punished. So either you would be telling them off or sending them um, some PowerPoints to look at or, uh, or you know a video about fish, fishing. <laughs> and that that usually doesn't um, doesn't teach them anything, and it just it causes them to be um, uh, embarrassed and humiliated. Um, one of the recent controversial examples um, that illustrates this very well is. Um, from uh, the UK, from West Midlands uh, Trains, who emailed uh, 2,500 employees with a message saying that they will get a one-off uh, bonus as a thank you for um, working really hard and in, during the COVID um, crisis. Um, however, the people who clicked on the link, uh, they got a message um, telling them that it was a company um, company organized um, phishing uh, simulation test, and there was not going to be any bonus. Um, so it just it just told them that this was a test designed by their own uh, organization, by their IT team, um, and um, this was a typical uh, typical phishing type of link that uh, promised uh, financial reward. Um, so West Midlands defended their um, their actions and their decisions. Um, they said that this email was just exactly the sort of thing that the criminals would uh, would use, um, but that kind of, uh, ex you know, that that leads to our point that it doesn't need to be fake. We don't need fake uh, emails or phishing emails as we get them enough um, as is without our employer actually paying someone to create those fake emails. And um, then some, most of the time, those kind of, those kind of campaigns can just seem lazy and inconsiderate um, if, if they're aiming to train their employees. In some cases like this one, that it's actually hurtful and it really caused a lot of pain to these people. And um, it, you know, it borderlines hazing uh, rather than training. So, you know, if, if you want to teach your, your, your um, employees or your colleagues that you, if you click on the link or you make a mistake and you're embarrassed, that's kind of okay. It, embarrassment is a negative emotion um, and it's a negative emotional response, but it's not as strong as being humiliated. As you see in this quote, humiliation is something that is being done to you. Um, so being humiliated by your own employer is not going to, uh, you know, to, to lead to you to learning something and being encouraged to behave in a different way, or at least not, not positively. So, um, you know, suggestion is to move towards training that doesn't involve huge negative uh, emotions and doesn't hurt people. <laughs> Um, so uh, even if you want to use phishing um, in this in this kind of, kind of education, that's okay, but it shouldn't be followed by a punishment, uh, but rather um, encouragement. So, for example, whoever reports um, those emails or those links gets um, a prize or some other um, gamification uh, methods. Thanks, Gita. Um, so our next one up is. Uh, my slides keep on jumping. It's back. blank. It's blank. There we go. Yeah, it's blank. No, the slide just said no to you. <laughs> no. And the next one up is the culture of no. Um, so for those of you who have either a teenager in the house or a toddler in the house, I think you probably get enough of the culture of no at home um, and you don't need it when you go to work. Um, the quote in the slide is from a team at the UK government's National Technical Authority for Information Assurance. Try saying that quickly. Um, and they say one of the most frustrating things we both hear is you can't do insert IT thing here for security reasons. 
Um, in the report, which we can share with people, the authors go on to say that they often hear their own guidance that they write, they wrote cited as a reason to say no to things. Um, the other thing we often see in this space is not just saying no to things, but a process which makes everything more difficult in the name of security. Um, and the authors note that in the report too. They talk of users seeing computers that take an age to boot up due to multiple security applications, internet access that blocks vast numbers of sites, restrictive lockdowns on smartphones that sometimes make them more like bricks than a productive device. Um, and all of this in the name of security. Um, I actually experienced something like this in a project a long time ago um, when we were supporting the NHS, uh, where the smart cards that they'd introduced for staff to use uh, to try and protect log on systems and access to privileged data uh, was so clunky to use and just took so, so much time for people to use and for the system to boot up that they ended up just using one person's card um, that was logged into the system all day um, because it was the only way they could access the health information they needed in the timely manner they needed to access it. So a default no or difficult processes don't necessarily equal good security at the end of the day. Getting back to my teenager versus toddler example, um, like any good helicopter parent, security teams can be so caught up in protecting their assets that they forget that the primary reason for the team to exist is actually to enable and support the organisation to do things and not to bring it to a stop. Many good intention policies, processes, laws, regulations create exactly this kind of environment. An example I always give is my favorite topic, GDPR. Um, one of the very first lines of GDPR states that it seeks to harmonize the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms of natural persons in respect to processing activities, and here's the whammy, and to ensure the free flow of personal data between member states. Um, and that's article three of GDPR, if anyone's interested in geeking out. Um, I think in reality, we all know that it, the implementation of GDPR has done a lot more to break the free flow than to enable it and to ensure it, um, particularly within Europe and even uh, globally. It doesn't mean that we're suggesting letting anyone do whatever they want, of course, it's all about balance. Um, we'd suggest starting off a project or a reaction to a request by thinking about how we can say yes to this and meet our requirements for security and integrity. And if you start with that yes, rather than no approach, it can start a better conversation than looking for ways to say no, even if it's not um, possible to facilitate everything at the end of the day. Yeah, so the next, uh, the next example is also related to a difficult conversation that needs to keep happening over and over again. And I'm sure that when we started this presentation, many of you thought that this is just going to be one of those um, women ranting about lack of diversity and lack of women in the security community. But we, we are still a minority and we all sat in those meetings and conference room full of uh, white men uh, on laptops. And, um, you know, the Dave rule, which started as an insider joke in Silicon Valley, is now um, a kind of a running joke in other communities as well. And if you haven't heard it, um, then um, the, the rule is that uh, once your work team includes as many women as it does people named Dave, then you have achieved uh, acceptable gender balance. But we're not there yet. I don't know how many percentages of Daves there are in a security community, but there are currently around um, one quarter, around one quarter of the overall cybersecurity workforce, a female. And um, the situation is getting better. So in 2017, only 11% of study respondents were women. So we can say that more of them are joining, but the problem is that now we need them to stay. So it's not enough to attract more diverse, um, it could be women, could be other minorities. It's not enough to attract them into the community or into the, these um, organizations, but also we need them to stay. Because here, um, lack of diversity is, um, both a cause of toxicity, toxic, toxicity, but also an outcome. So um, a lot of people uh, from the minorities, female and other minorities noted that uh, they feel like they're unable or they just don't want to stay in the team anymore because of these to toxic behaviors and toxic cultures. So um, what we can do is of course, create policies. Uh, we can create uh, engagement and career development plans for everyone that, you know, that everyone can benefit from. Um, and we can try to make um, um, workers feel more welcome that way. But really, the key to in making everyone uh, feel included and safe is just changing the culture. The organizational culture needs to be a priority. And um, professionalism and empathy must be expected and modeled um, from, from the highest management um, down. 
Well, thanks for that, Sagita. Um, and obviously, at the moment, it's Pride Month. Um, and if you look on Twitter at the Women in Identity group, um, they have also tweeted out some really amazing stats this morning um, on representation of um, LGBTQ uh, groups within the workforce as well. And that's really important that we look at as well. Um, moving on to um, another area um, that's closely related, though, is um, issues around ableist design. Um, and the quote that's up on the screen is about capture. I don't think it's going to amaze anyone to think that capture is not perhaps the best thing to use when considering people with disabilities of any type. Um, but when researching potential issues that security processes can create for people with disabilities, um, this particular W3C working group that were looking at the inaccess inaccessibility of capture and alternatives to visual Turing tests on the web, which is a very catchy title, um, their findings really hit home, I think. Um, essentially, at the end of the day, our efforts to identify the difference between a computer and a human um, basically excluded people with disabilities from that definition of human um, and that really struck home and that really sucks and we have to stop things like this um, the problems we have captured are well documented and well talked about but there are many many different approaches we use to authenticate users that can automatically exclude certain groups of users um, some examples of that might be the requirement for a highly complex password string without providing a password manager that can work effectively with a screen reader assistive app or voice input software um, that can immediately lock out users with vision impairments or users with learning disabilities. Um, there was again, I obviously spent some time on Twitter this morning, um, a really good string uh, where one guy was really defending his position um, that all password managers were bad and evil and insecure. Um, and he was looking at the, the attack surface of them. Um, from a technical standpoint, he may have been 100% accurate, um, but he simply wasn't looking at the bigger picture in terms of usability and particularly around disability guidelines. Um, other issues that have come up repeatedly are issues with bias and facial recognition systems that's achieved national news coverage. Um, it's been the subject of extensive research by the Turing Institute. Um, and when I was reading uh, one of their reports, um, they actually noted that um, this kind of facial bias began all the way back in the 19th century with the development of photography. Um, for generations, the chemical makeup of film was designed to be best um, at capturing light skin, surprise, surprise. Um, color film was insensitive to the wide range of non-white skin types and often failed to show the details of darker skinned faces. Um, I think we have to accept then that biometrics do not always offer the golden solution to flawed authentication processes. Again, we're recommending a really simple check here. Um, when a new process policy or procedure is put in place, every project should ask itself, who might we be disenfranchising with this work? What are the risks of vulnerable, disabled or underrepresented groups being accidentally locked out by these decisions? And what we're doing with this is taking the you know, rather basic Turing test of human um, versus computer and really embracing a test that looks at all aspects of humanity. The next uh, behavior that we wanted to point out as toxic is the blame game or finger pointing. Um, so when a significant big incident happens in an organization, the focus in a toxic environment immediately would go to who, who's the one to blame. And uh, this type of organization by, uh, looks for a scapegoat and eventually, um, more often than not, someone gets fired. So this is even more prevalent now when uh, many of those security cases are becoming more public due to the overall increase in legal action. And as a result, uh, many more CISOs or similar type of um, uh, position, uh, positions in organizations, they get their, um, their contracts terminated as a result. So Nominate uh, study has um, found out that an average tenure of a CISO is less than three years. And uh, even more, uh, nearly a third of the respondents say that it's less than two years. So one of the things that you can do um, is to analyze the average tenure of your security leadership. And if it turns out to be less than three years or even worse, less than two years, this could be a warning sign that maybe you, your culture needs to change. Um, but Nominate also did a um, CISO stress report um, last year in 2019, and the vast majority of CISOs, 88%, um, claim that they are moderately or tremendously stressed at work. And one third of them um, said that stress affected their ability to do their job. So what happens here is 
they're stressed uh, 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 they're, they're stressed because you know their job and then they're more likely to make a mistake and because they make mistakes they get fired and then it's like an, an endless circle um so another um uh, thing that was really worrying is that 95 percent almost all of the uh, interviewed CISO said that um, they work more than contract, their contracted hours, and 87% of them said that working additional hours was expected by their organization. So that obviously can lead to high rates of burnout. And um, it's, it just signifies a failure in overall organization leadership, um, So, in, in, which shows that you know, changing this um, and making it a more positive culture it becomes more crucial than ever because all of these CISOs are just going to burn out one day and who's going who's to take responsibility. So what we advise um, to do is uh, monitor employees' mental health, promote uh, work-life balance, um, and then things go wrong and things will go wrong because it doesn't matter you know, how, how hard you work, uh, incidents happen. Um, we suggest to use um, blame-free tools such as uh, hot wash, um, sessions uh, where you just discuss what went well, what what you could improve, and um, uh, definitely avoid pointing fingers like this guy in the slide does. So uh, moving on from your employees to how you might treat um, other users within your organization and maybe externally uh, is loser attitude. Um, and this is the definition of people talking about a painfully annoying, stupid or irritating computer user. And yet we all know them, we all experience them every day. Users can be a complete pain to work with. Um, they can be very, very frustrating, getting users to understand that security measures you want to put in place and why they're necessary can be really problematic. There's the old adage of the problem exists between the keyboard and the chair, and we get it. However, if you immediately go into every act interaction with your users with this attitude, the conversation immediately starts off on the wrong foot. Um, if we combine this with some of the other attitude challenges we've talked about here in this presentation, hero culture, culture of no, blame game, the interactions between security staff and users can quickly become fraught and lead to some very, very common problems. Uh, if you assume that all users are stupid, you assume you don't need to explain anything to them because they're too stupid to understand the directions, right? Uh, security patches, processes and requirements can often be barked out as orders with the assumption that the user should follow the commands blindly because security. Um, busy users may simply ignore instructions as they don't feel they have the information to process or can even feel insulted by the lack of information shared because, you know, they perhaps don't think they're as stupid as you do. Taking the time to give users a really brief overview of why a measure has been brought in, what the impact is, how it can help them, this can quickly avoid resentment and can quickly avoid a breakdown in communication and interaction between teams. Loser attitude and snapshot judgments of user abilities can also lead to other toxic behaviours, um, especially if left to an individual staff. In one of my early job roles, our team was somewhat of a satellite team supported by one guy from the university IT department. Um, we were not allowed admin rights on our laptops, it's fairly common at the time, um, but some discretion was given as the job roles performed by my team weren't typical user profiles. The way this IT guy decided to uh, apply that discretion was to allow admin rights to all the men within the team, but not to any of the women. That was a long time ago, right? <laughs> it was a while ago now. Hopefully that changed, but that's, a, that's still a very good illustration of how that uh, can go wrong. Um, so the last, uh, the last uh, example that we chose of toxic, um, toxic behaviors, or um, in, this, in this scenario, perhaps the toxic security personality type, is then security uh, manager is um, isolated and um, he, doesn't like to he or she sorry, doesn't like to listen to the actual business side of the discussions. Um, they don't try to learn the unique challenges of operations teams and business managers. Um, for them, secure is secure period, and the context doesn't matter, um, the risks don't matter, um, and, you know, the, the attitude, this attitude just leads, um, leads them to becoming irrelevant, or at least isolated. So um, security managers or, or security teams could be an entire team who behave in this way or who, um, who has this attitude, they just make enemies of themselves in an organization um, and create boundaries between security and the rest of organization. And what needs to happen if we really want to achieve our goals is the opposite. It, it, you know, security team and security people need to become integral part of the organization and um, help people do their jobs 
um, in a secure manner, um, but ra rather than preventing them from completing some tasks. Um, and make by making things more secure, think about how uh, to make the colleagues' lives easier and rather, rather than more difficult. But all of that requires understanding of the organization, of the industry, of the context. And um, for that, security leaders or security people need to be more open. They need to be more networked in the organization and uh, more transparent with the rest of the organization. And in that way, we can create a proactive rather than um, reactive security culture. So those are the 10, uh, 10 um, problems that we identified, but we don't want to just talk about problems. As I said at the beginning, we would like you, uh, each one of you, to take at least one, one uh, piece of homework home and, uh, and try to change something. So we prepared a quick solution slide um, for you as well. And um, the first one um, is uh, diversity. We mentioned it many times. This word uh, was mentioned many times in our presentation. And it's not something that is just going to happen if we sit here and wait for more different people to join cybersecurity. We really um, need to have a deliberate and well thought out diversity and communication plan. And um, some organizations have already done that. So we can consult the community on that and, and uh, by, uh, diversify our teams in that way. So the second point is to support and manage positive team culture. And it's not just enough to allow the team culture to grow organically. You need to really put some thought and effort into planning to making a team culture that's positive, both within the team itself and in its interactions with other teams within the, the organization. Um, we suggest that you empower rather than belittle our users. So ideally, we all want uh, everyone in our organization and our communities to be security conscious. Uh, but for that to happen, we need to stop thinking and making them, the users, feel like they're the weakest link and uh, include them in all things security instead. And to go alongside that, you really need to have a meaningful training program tailored not only to your organization, but tailored to your users and one that the users can enjoy participating in. And the last advice is uh, work on how to say yes and. And I like this one because it comes from uh, improv theater where um, you you always say yes and. So we're not saying that you always need to say yes immediately, but before you say no, make sure that it's a definitely a no and at least genuinely try to find a solution to their problem before denying them whatever request um, that, that, was, um, that was sent to you. And that's it. That's the end of our presentation. Um, and I think we're slightly over time. Um, and I believe we go to uh, over to WorkAdventure for questions. Sure.